Hi, welcome to another edition of The Hot Spot. Yours truly, Moulton says, alongside C.P. Burke. Today we have author Daniel Brown. So don't forget to please like, share, and subscribe. Enjoy the show, and thank you for watching. Somebody who has sort of followed some of my work throughout the years would realize that I use a lot of biblical imagery and allegory sometimes in my writing. For sure. Um, I don't know if everybody's brain works this way, but the way that my brain works is whenever I'm thinking of a story idea, I can see the characters in my mind interacting. So it's already a movie in my head. You're listening to the Fresh Green Song. You're listening to the Green Internet Radio. It's now nine minutes after six o'clock in the nation's capital. It's nine minutes after seven if you live in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We had the privilege to have Daniel Brown with us tonight. And your host for this evening is Mr. Moulton Sears. Okay, thank you, Sip. Uh, just wanted to give a shout out to Radio Land. Uh, pleasant good evening, good afternoon, wherever in the world you may be listening to us, our Facebook audience. I want to give you a shout out, especially to our dedicated um, audience. Um, right about now, we have, um, like they say, sometimes they say the son of the soil, but we say the daughter of the soil. Um, she's a writer, educator, um, should I say you're a vlogger as well, but she's got a, a, her own uh, YouTube channel that you can follow her on things that she loves. Um, Janelle Brown. Janelle, welcome to the program. Welcome to the hot spot. You're in the hot spot right now. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you. We, we, it's a pleasure to have you as well. We usually go, go back and say, take us to your humble beginnings where you fell in love with writing and, and stuff like that. So just take us back you know, to your humble beginnings. In a lot of ways, I still consider myself to be in my humble beginnings <laughs> because I'm 25 years old and um, well, my mother is a senior education officer and my father is a pastor as well as he has his own construction company. So I really got my love for language from my mother because she was a teacher for quite a long time before she went into the Ministry of Education officially. So she was a teacher and my eldest sister is also into language and English. She's five years my senior and I have an, another older sister, but she's more the math person. So by the time I came along, there was already a love for language within the home. The first thing we learned was standard English because my parents' philosophy was that when we get into school, we would pick up Creole, which was true. Mm -hmm. So I loved books. As soon as I could read, I read everything. I started getting really annoying because I would read the labels on everything in the house. I would read the back of the peanut butter. I always wanted to be the one to read Bible verses when we had devotions and stuff like that. So my love for reading eventually got to my love for writing because I always wanted to also be a creator. I didn't just want to be a consumer. So um, I always remember those poems that you have to create when you're in primary school, when Mother's Day and Father's Day are coming up and they're like, write your parents a poem. I want to say that's where I got my start. But mm -hmm. when I officially wanted to get into poetry and be a serious poet, was when I was about in Form 1 at the Girls High School. I wrote my first unpublished poetry collection. And it was just something, a personal project for me, just to prove to myself that I could do it. And from there, I started challenging myself. I started writing on different topics, trying out different poetic forms, mm -hmm. trying out different subject matters. And that's how I got started, really. Mm -hmm. I resonate with what you said because um, does or did 
you, your, your parents being um, a pastor, did reading the Bible kind of help you develop that love for reading, as per se? Oh, for sure. And I think anybody who has sort of followed some of my work throughout the years would realize that I use a lot of biblical imagery and allegories sometimes in my writing. One of my favorites is the, the fall of man, which involves like the fruit in the garden and the snake. I use that imagery um, throughout a lot of my work. So, and I also consider the Bible to be a timeless piece of literature mm -hmm. and it's filled with so many different types of figurative languages. So, yeah, the Bible in a lot of ways inspired and fostered my creativity when it came to writing and reading. Right. Before we get into the, the nitty gritty of, of stuff, um, where in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, tell us where you grew up or where you're from or where you reside. Well, I am a proud, proud, proud country girl. Um, during the eruption, I changed my Twitter handle to Country Bookie because I am from North Union, specifically mm -hmm. New Grounds. I never make any qualms about letting people know where I'm from, even though I work in town, country forever. So, yeah. <laughs> true, true, true. Well, well, I can tell you I'm, I'm country forever too, and CP as well, we are both from the country, so. <laughs> but, but, but. <laughs> so, um, no, when you said, you also, you, you write poetry, you write mm -hmm. short stories, and we'll get into your latest children book. That seemed to be like a, a kind of divorce area where you you are um, you're mastering the three of them. Um, growing up, growing up now with literature, did, did you ever think that you were going to be a writer, or you just, or did you ever just love the literature, the, like reading stories? Did you ever think, what was your dream in terms of literature? The very first dream I can recall having was that I wanted to be a teacher. Um, I really wanted to be a teacher because of my mother, because my mother was a teacher. And I remember she taught at the primary school I attended, which had its pros and cons. I mean, I couldn't make any trouble. But I remember all of the children just being obsessed <laughs> with my mother and the impact that she had on their lives. and. I think I, I was drawn more to the impact than to the profession. But at the time, I was a child, so I conflated the two. But when I got a little bit older, maybe I was like about nine, I realized that what I really, really wanted to do was I wanted to write. Because there were times when I would read a book and the way that it made me feel as I was transported into a different realm altogether, I was like, I want the ability to do that because it feels like a superpower. So that's where I really wanted to write. And I never just wanted to write. I always said, I will be a best-selling author. It hasn't happened yet, mm -hmm. but that was has been and is my ambition to be a best-selling author. Yeah. Well, you have all the, you have all the time in the world, but I can tell you that you're on your <laughs> you're on your way to there, and there's no further you can go than than going up. You know, climb up the ladder. Um, Thank you. you being an educator yourself, um, your mom. I guess obviously you followed in your mom's footsteps, but outside of the family, who would you say you were uh, you looked up to? As in, as in writing? In terms of writing? Well, my favorite poet right now is Kendall Hippolyte. He has been my favorite poet for since I was in college because we did his poetry collection in college. And he was the one who really opened my eyes to the way in which literature can be used as a conduit for teaching history because history was also one of my interests. But people tend to present history as, oh, it's so boring and tedious. But his work made me realize that the creative aspect could be introduced to history and make it palpable for all audiences. So Kendall Hippolyte, in terms of poetry, as well as Rupi Kaur, 
Um, she's an Indian poet and her work is phenomenal. Her book, Milk and Honey, I remember reading it and it inspired me in so many different ways. That year that I read that book, I wrote at least six poems a day. Wow. And sometimes it would get to numbers like nine and 11 just because I was so inspired by her process and her own creativity. So those two in terms of poetry, in terms of short stories and novels, James Patterson is my favorite author because he writes thrillers and I love not knowing what would happen next. So those are some of my influences in terms of writing. So have you been or have you ever thought about writing plays or um, scripts, movie scripts? Oh, for sure. Um, I don't know if everybody's brain works this way, but the way that my brain works is whenever I'm thinking of a story idea, I can see the characters in my mind interacting. So it's already a movie in my head. Mm. And um, I've written plays before. I wrote this whole musical for my church when I was about 18 and we did a production of it and to be honest I was very proud of it at the time I don't know if I'd be proud of it now but I thought it was great I got some really good feedback unfortunately we didn't like record anything I think I may have the script somewhere still but I did dabble a bit in being a playwright but mostly poetry and um, writing novels is where I am at. Okay, there, there is um, there is a surge of writers in like coming out of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I don't know. Um, unfortunately, we are so blessed that you know we have a lot, a lot more people now who are um, publishers and and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's just um, it just happened, or do you what? What do you think is the the reason for for that being a source? Is it because of like people are it being influenced by an older generation, or is it just naturally happening? What What's your thought on that? I think that the surge we are seeing in writing is primarily due to more attention being paid to the creative art. That's because when I was younger, when I started telling people that I wanted to be a best-selling author, they would be like, and what else? Like, it was never just, <laughs> oh, that's great, pursue mm -hmm. it. It was always like, yeah, but you can write and do anything else. So mm -hmm. what are you going to rely on for your finances? Mm -hmm. And I think that these days, we are seeing an upsurge in creativity because persons are being given different avenues and opportunities to explore that, like the Haruna Film Fest and the Nigel H. Thomas um, Fiction Prize. Mm -hmm. There are different writing competitions that are offering monetary um, prizes. So money is always a great motivator. I mean, come on. <laughs> so there are the people who they wrote in school because they had to, and they always got good grades for it. And then when an opportunity like this comes along, they're like, oh, wait, I remember that I was good at this in school. Maybe I still have it. So then they participate. I'm actually a part of a writer's group called The Nucleus. It consists of myself, my elder sister, Justin Howard, LaFleur Coburn, Denise Westfield, Tommy. Like, we are all established writers in our own right. And I'm seeing more and more persons popping up in St. Vincent in terms of writing. And it's so exciting. Mm -hmm. Well, we will have to talk about that because um, one day we would like to have you guys on. Um, or our program because um, we like to promote you know that kind of venture especially when it comes to education yeah so we'll we'll, uh, we'll, we'll make a, a separate date for that where we can have you guys on talk you know where you can motivate people because the reason I'm saying that is that I myself when I was little I had dreams of being um, a poet not, a, not like you are um, 
bestseller, but um, <laughs> and the people I admire were, were local people, or just mm -hmm. I just I admire because that's the only one I knew then who published a book was Peggy Carr, and and when I she got the title of when I saw poet Peggy Carr, I was so like I want to be called a poet. I want to be called a poet. So um, I'm yeah, actually. So I, Sorry to cut you, but like I'm actually really glad that you mentioned like local influences because part of our writers group is Grace Peters Clark, and she was a teacher at high school very briefly when I was there. But she taught my elder sister, who is now in the same writers group, and every person who I interact with who knows her has such high praise for her as a teacher, as a writer. So I think sometimes we underestimate our own local quality in terms sure. of any profession really so i'm glad that you mentioned those being your your um influences even if they were all you knew at the time still mm. entirely valid and maybe we should be inspired more by our local persons she was right. she was also on our program as yeah, well yeah i was about to tell you that she was yes she was i i, I will give you at the end i'll give you um because this is going on youtube as well right so you're gonna yes. be on our youtube um i'll send you the, the the link where you can see her interview um for cartman when she did cartman cartman yes exactly yeah. cartman yeah mm -hmm. um yeah yeah so that's what we try to do as well we try to you know, promote locally, you know, and, and sometimes we expand and go outside of uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, but um, CPU is say St. Vincent is priority, so. That's <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> um, so, yeah, so um, when when we look at you and the, the things that you have achieved at, at 25, it's it's amazing, and, and I hope that um, youngsters are, are, are looking up to you um, the younger generation is looking up to you as as a, a true influence. Um, you have um, won several awards. If you can just tell us about that before CP comes in, tell us like uh, some of the achievement that you have done because I, I don't want to miss any of it. You know, so I I just <laughs> prefer you to, to let us know. You know. Oh my goodness! It's always so awkward for me when people ask me these things because I genuinely can't remember. I genuinely struggle to remember, but <laughs> thankfully I have my iPad on hand. So I'll see if I can find the, um, the document that talks about all of that. But I mentioned the Nigel H. Thomas um, Fiction Prize. I did win that. I also won the i forget exactly how it's um let me see if i can find it right okay so i won the independence poetry competition the open cac category that was a uh, saint vincent and the grenadines competition so i won that for poetry in 2019 i have a few publications in um this Antiguan based magazine, Intersec Anu. Mm -hmm. I also was long listed for the Brooklyn Caribbean Literature Fest Elizabeth Nunes Award for Writers mm -hmm. last year and this year. I was third place for the Ellsworth Shape Keen Poetry Prize last year. Um, I got published in Cola magazine this year, which was really exciting because that's um, that magazine was founded by Nigel H. Thomas, and he's based in Canada as well. So that's a Canadian magazine. And um, I got the first place short story prize in the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Ministry of Foreign Affairs National Innovation Competition this year. Yes, I think those are the prizes. Wow, and it's all at age to, or before age 26, all at age 25. <laughs> Amazing. Neither Thomas you. is just in Montreal. Yeah. So. Janiel, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to go back a little bit but while you're beginning. I, no I know how you started, and I know the stress sometimes I got when I was small, trying to speak 
the way we're supposed to speak. My father was a headmaster. Uh, uh, and there's, we cannot speak any broken language in the house. Mm -hmm. When we write, we have to write properly. So I know exactly the pressure. Sometimes you go down the road and you start talking and, you know, everybody with the other language and they, you know, the names, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the names that they call you. Yes. Oh my goodness. I'm so happy that somebody could relate because sometimes when I talk about this, people are like, yeah, that's weird. But it was almost as though as soon as you hit the gate, you have to switch back into standard because you're picking up the dialect at school and like you're trying to communicate with everybody. They would say you're stush, you're bougie, you're trying to play white. Oh. Yeah, I, I know because... <laughs> Even even when I get a pronunciation, even words, we can't even yeah. mispronounce a word at home. My father yes. was very strict also when it comes to education. And um, that tells me today to um, kind of get over yeah. it. And then I know, I know exactly how you feel. So now, being a teacher, being an educator in the classroom, how do you conduct your class when it comes to, like, say, standard English towards broken mm -hmm. English? Well, most times I try to lead by example. Um, standard English is generally my go-to, but some of my students find it difficult to reciprocate. Uh, a strategy that we implemented at Bishop's College Kingston, which is where I teach, is we have a code switching competition because I think it's also important to teach students that nation language or dialect or Creole is not bad. It's just different. And it's very important to be able to switch and navigate both standard English as well as nation language. Were you there, were you there with Miss King? Yes, I was Miss King. And I started teaching maybe three, three years ago, I think, yes. And Miss King was my first principal, my introduction to teaching. And I'm forever grateful because exceptional woman, exceptional principal, exceptional educator. You, you know why I asked you that? Are you a past student? I'm a past student. I'm also one of the um, close friends of Miss King. Oh, uh, wow. Also my sister. And you, you really? Know, yeah, you know, she's a netballer. She used to be a netballer for people. Yes, yes. She was a goal shooter for Bishop's College King. So one of the one of the top goal shooters at that time. So I uh, Miss King was basically a family friend um to me and also to my sister. I don't know if my sister was a, just a retired headmistress as well. Oh okay. she's on the board. She's also on the Bishop's College board. Wow. Yeah. This is like a full circle moment almost for me. Yes, 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 it is. Yeah. You're, you're right at home. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> she, was, she was a very good friend of mine. Yeah, so um, be, be, being at Bishop's College also, um, I'll tell you something, taught me a lot of stuff as mm -hmm. well. My principal at that time was Mr. Lennox John. Mm -hmm. And what he did to Bishop's College I don't think anybody really did that to Bishop's College because he took Bishop's College from where it was at that time and made Bishop's College a household name in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, especially when it comes to sports. Yeah. So um, Bishop's College was one of those top sports schools in, in Kingston at that time for a tiny school that went in both the netball and the um, football at that time. So compliments also. I'd like to just insert here that you said was but it's still happening because even last week we were celebrating the accomplishments of our netballers and footballers so you'll be very proud to know that Bishop's College is still on top of things yeah, yeah glad to know that that's that's where my soccer um soccer career started oh wow inspired me to play with top teams in St. Vincent and the Grenadines I was one time playing with one of the top teams in St. Vincent called Rosians I don't know if you're if you heard about that team. I haven't, but I have now. Yeah. That's that's with a lot of a national players was on that team. Yeah, so let's sometimes we like to just break our thing to just 
get thing. We don't really like to stop to one topic. So you, oh, you, that's you, fine. You, you're going to find our interviews and not just asking you questions, but we like to, we like it as a discussion. I love that. So, yeah. So go, go, going, going back to that now, what, and you, and you, when you passed to, um, you went to the CP, something like that, they call it. And then you enter high school. What 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 was your um your standard like when come to high school? Because I would like to ask that because a lot of people don't really realize people from that side of the country always get high marks in English. What was your English math? Well, it was common entrance at the time, and I think my marks went something like this: eighty-five for math. 86 for, I think it was general paper, and 87 for English, which I was kind of shocked about because everything was at one point below the other. And generally, I consider myself to suck at math. So I was surprised that it was so high and surprised that my English was so low. I was honestly expecting 90s, but um, one of my invigilators who taught at high school at the time snitched on me to my sisters and was telling them she's going to sleep after every exam. I'm not sure if she'll pass. So maybe that was because of it. But um, my standing, I came 33rd for girls and 62nd overall, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, somewhere around there. Because sometimes that um, that leads us to things that other people don't really see in us. Mm. The way we project ourselves, the the quality that we have within us, and that we put out to other people. That you know, we always like to lead by example. So it's it's really important that a lot of people follow the people who are leaders rather than mm -hmm. come behind. So I I would like to say that to you that. Um, just being speak, uh, having a little conversation with you. There's some qualities I see as a leader. And thank you. One thing I, I would like you to do is to continue that showing that leadership. Because with strong leadership, you can you can build a lot of kids, teach mm -hmm. them the proper things, tell them the proper things. Because sometimes I find some teachers just go into the classroom just because they want a, a salary in their hand. Yep. And and they forget about the teachers that behind who show a lot more quality than they are. And it's always nice to lead the way rather than um try try to follow. So as you know, coming back to your literature side, how, how do you write? What inspire you to write? How do you write when you home? Do you dream about it how how how, how do you start uh, um right right literature well if i were to write my dreams i would be writing a lot of fantasy because my dreams are always crazy <laughs> but i i pull inspiration from everywhere to be honest when i went to cave hill i studied literatures in english with a minor in history and one of my lecturers um Robert Lishan, he told us to keep a journal. And he's like, you have to journal as frequently as possible. Try to do it every day. And I was like, oh my God, this is so tedious. But I grew to really appreciate it because every little thing I was journaling, even sometimes I would just hear a word that I thought was interesting. And I'm like, I'd like to use that in a poem. And I'd make note of it. If I heard a phrase, that I thought sounded appealing or it had a lot of imagery attached to it, I wrote it down. If I saw something that sparked my curiosity, I'd write it down. So I think that inspiration can be pulled from absolutely anywhere. Sometimes I'm reading someone else's work and the imagery that I get from it inspires something in me because no two people are ever going to interpret the same thing in the same way. So I found that sometimes I would like to reinterpret a phrase or a few words, things like that. So I pull inspiration from anywhere, but especially the people 
around me real life experiences. Well, in case you just join us, we are having a conversation with Ms. Janelle Brown. She's an educator, uh, author, poet, and a whole lot more to come. Um, Janelle, if we have to, have to dive into um, your, your latest novel, if I want to call it, or children's uh, storybook, My Mommy, the Superhero. Tell us how that um, topic came about. Well, the National Public Library was having an initiative to inspire reading. And I thought it would be good to write about a role model because I think most times my writing is sort of dark or heavy. It's normally about heavy topics because I think as Caribbean people, there are a lot of things that we are very silent about. So one of my main initiatives is to break that silence. But I want it to be super positive because it was a children's book okay. as well. And I thought about how Mother's Day is insufficient when it comes to celebrating the contributions of mothers in the lives of their children. And my sister, um, she has two children now, so she's also a mother. So the inspiration came from both my mother and my sister and just watching the sacrifices that they make, the way in which I remember my mother impacting my own childhood. So I just tried to cram all of those feelings into a short story. All right. But if I have to be the devil's advocate, I would say that... Um... Mothers are always getting those attention or, or the superhero mm -hmm. attention because there's Mother's Day not as recognized as, as there's Mother's Day and there's Father's Day. Father's Day is not mm -hmm. as recognized as, as Mother's Day. So the mothers are always getting the attention. So and when it comes to superhero, um, kids tend to to think of the father as, as a superhero. But you went you went against uh, if I have to say the tie. So I'm glad you mentioned that because. I think there's a misconception that fathers are under celebrated when really it is Mother's Day is as celebrated as it is because the mothers hype themselves up. The mothers are the ones who push Mother's Day. So if the father started pushing Father's Day as well, we would see some of that. But my father, my father is also a superhero and I generally people perceive me as a as a daddy's girl. So I thought it would be special to do something for my mother this time around. So it's kind of like <laughs> well, trying right, to please both. Right. And, and you know, um, shout out to kudos to all the mothers out there, especially the ones who are also um, a father. You know, um, we know they can't really be a father, but yeah. they're, they're trying their best to, to fill in the gaps for the missing fathers around. Um, how do you do... So go from being like a poet to get into children's story because the mind frame has to be different. So walk us through the, the transition because you're in three different categories right now. But, but I'm more interested in how you got from the others to the children's story part because it's not easy writing book for kids. Yeah. So as I mentioned before, very early in my writing journey, I challenge myself a lot. I didn't wait for somebody to suggest a topic or an angle. I always tried to do whatever it is I thought would be hardest for me to do, which included writing from the male perspective, writing, I would research things and then write. So when I feel like I've exhausted many topics when it comes to poetry, so when the National Public Library, when I heard about their writer's initiative and I was approached, I was like, my first instinct was to say, well, I'm not a children's author. But then when I thought about it, I saw it as a new opportunity to challenge myself yet again. And I wrote up a draft for the story, bearing in mind that I had to keep my language as simple as possible because I was writing for children. But 
not too simple because I also wanted them to be able to learn from it. Mm -hmm. So that was a, a bit of a tightrope to walk. I had to consider the age group for which I'm writing. What do what does a child's voice sound like? Which is something that I also explored at university a little bit. But I initially just wrote it, sent it to my writers group, and I was like, help me, please. <laughs> like, see, what do you guys think about this? And they were like, oh, you know, this is really good. It sounds like a child and they thought it was fine so I I went ahead with it I was like okay great I trust your judgment and yeah but the transition was a bit difficult yeah mm -hmm. do you have a copy of the book there with you well here is where I'd like to address this misconception so it was my first ever children's story in terms of a physical book that's what I'm working on currently in terms of getting it published. But I've hit a little um, bump in the road in terms of publishing because when it comes to children's books, um, they're more expensive when it comes to illustration because, you know, children, you want color and stuff like that. So whereas for publishing a poetry collection, it'll be easy, breezy, peasy. For a children's book, the illustration is a bit more costly. So that's a road bump there with publishing the book. But I do have my digital copy of the story. Mm -hmm. So I, well, I must say, I, I got a sneak peek of um, on your YouTube channel. Um, oh. <laughs> and that brought, up, that brought about a lot of answers to how you we went about writing it because you were actually um, telling it in the tone of, how a child would, un would understand. And then I, it came to me that, okay, maybe that's how you write. Because like I said, I, I myself, I, I love writing, right? But I, I cannot imagine myself going um, with the thought of writing a children's book because, you know, you have to go back to that stage. But when I saw you, the way you were telling the story, I go, okay, that's the, that's the mindset you have to have. So tell us um, what, what should parents expect from from that book like the it, without giving it away like give us like the, <laughs> the main storyline of it so the story follows a child named Rhea Rhea has a little brother and the story and the world is presented through Rhea's eyes naturally everything seems a bit more dramatic when you're a child so she's just observing her mother and piecing things together through the stories and the fairy tales that she has seen involving superheroes and her mother's own mother mannerisms and behaviors. So she's making that connection. I think parents can expect a book that is positive, that strays away from superheroes like Hulk and superman and batman to something a bit more relatable for mm -hmm. children i really want children to be inspired to see a superhero within their own parents because sometimes as a child i found myself being ungrateful or not even realizing some of the sacrifices that they made because i was too busy being dramatic in my head like oh I didn't get this toy I wanted why are they so mean <laughs> when you don't see all of the backstage things happening to make those provisions for you so I just want children to sort of focus on the positives and the sacrifices that their parents make to make them happy mm -hmm. so did um did your or does your sister having two kids you said did that have anything, any influence on you coming up with a children's story? Oh, for sure. Because when my nephew was um, about to be born, I was living with my sister and my brother-in-law at the time. So I sort of was there for the pregnancy and I was terrified because I have watched her grow up because she's just five years my senior. I've watched her grow up and now I'm watching her grow. There's somebody growing in her. And it was very scary for me. But when he was born, it like opened an entirely new realm of love 
in that I didn't know I was capable of. And I wrote a poem for his birth about him. And then I wrote another poem about um, his little sister when she was pregnant with her. And writing about children sort of made the transition less unnatural into writing from a child's perspective because I like to use a lot of figurative language and um, comparisons and similes and metaphors and stuff like that. So it kind of helped to get into the mind frame of things surrounding children. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, any plans of putting that, um, the digital form in, on paper? For sure. I mean, I'm already in talks about publishing it, but like I said, sometimes the, the finances, they do be fighting. So that is really the, um, the hiccup right now, to just illustration, getting funding for that. But um, being as I am and doing what I want to do, I definitely am saving towards that because I realized that this is something that I want to put into the Vincentian society and I want people to have access to it because multiple people have been asking me for it and it's about time I deliver. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So what kind of publishing is it going to be? Is it going to be like where you give the rights, all the rights to, let's say, Amazon, and it's based on when you sell, or you just want, you, you want to have um, control of, of the publishing? Well, I'm going the route of self-publishing with assistance from Amazon publishers, because I don't want to sell all the rights to my book to someone else. Mm -hmm. And I also... I want to see just how far I can get in terms of self-publishing because self-publishing is almost like a toss-up because it can be very beneficial. If you are very successful, mm -hmm. then you don't have to give up as much profit. The initial spending is really the most spending that you'd have to do. But um, that's if you're very successful. So I kind of want to see what my support would be like, how the Vincent and public will treat me. And then <laughs> I'll go from there with further publishing and my well, other projects. Yeah, well, um, I'm sure it's not only the Vincent and public, I'm, I'm sure the whole diaspora will, will, will be um, supporting you. I must say though, that, that, that I think that for me, the right thing to do is to have control over it because Sometimes mm -hmm. when let's say Amazon, they have when they have the publishers have control over it, and you you tell people, hey, can you support me and buy this book? They don't really feel like they're supporting you because you're not getting much from from that sale. So mm -hmm. you know it's better you take your time like you're doing and um and and do the publishing yourself whenever it comes through. Um, I hope there's someone out there listening and and can support you. And I'm also surprised that we don't actually have for the amount of material that are that are coming out of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I'm surprised that we don't have an actual publisher in St. Vincent or someone who's taking on that mantle because it's it's getting really uh, popular coming out of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna let CP jump in and then when we come back we're gonna we're gonna just uh, wrap up. No problem. Yeah. Jenny, one thing I would like to say as I always take this up when I do an interview is about financial control and mm -hmm. I'm really happy that you decide to take that initiative yourself rather than give it to somebody else because in my days of growing up I know about little things because of where I came from is that they never make a profit mm. they're always in the hole so you're always in the hole while they make a profit and they tell you they do not make a profit so i'm glad that you're really taking that up on yourself and make sure that you do most of the finances so everything come back it comes back to you rather than have to go through somebody else to come to you so i'm i'm really happy that you're doing that 
with, with that being said now, how do you look at yourself, like say a couple years down the road doing this? Do you think that at some point you think it's going to be beneficial for you to just concentrate on um, poetry rather than doing something else? It doesn't have to be, but it's just an opinion. No, this this has always been my goal to write as my main form of income because I believe that once you are employed doing what you love, it would never feel like a chore or burdensome. And in a way, I do have that with teaching, but my primary love is writing and creating. So I do think that eventually it would get to the point where it's profitable enough for me to rely on it. And it's something that I really look forward to actually. Do, do you write and um, keep like say uh, a digital side of unpublished material? Do you have a lot of unpublished material right now? Yes, I definitely do. Now, one of the things that I practice and I encourage anybody who's interested in writing to practice as well. Don't just write and then have it sitting there. Enter as many competitions as you can because a lot of competitions give monetary um, rewards as well as sometimes publishing deals. So that could take some pressure off of you if you do win and you are picked up. So I have a lot of unpublished stuff. I have stuff that I wrote since high school. They're in my actual high school notebook on my bookshelf. So, yeah. Yeah, because that's important because once you start, you have to have a continuity in order to be financially successful. Yep. And once you do not have that continuity, you'll find that the finance that keep drying up and keep they drying dry up. up. And, yeah. So, um, so you, that that's very important to at least bring out maybe one book a year. Make sure that you don't kill if it's very successful that you don't bring out another one and kill it. A lot of people yeah. do that as well. So uh, those are little things that um, we need to take into consideration and make sure that people do do it and make sure that mm -hmm. other people learn from it because that's why something I like this program is that and I say I don't like I don't like to come we don't like to come here and just look on the paper and start asking you questions. We prefer it to be where it take us. And what, yeah. wherever it take us is get more interesting. But with that said, you better start giving your other colleagues a heads up that we will be sending a general invitation for them to come on Vince Internet Radio to um, talk about themselves the work yes. and the future. In that said, I'm just going to pass him up over to the host, Mr. Morton says. Not the time to run, so they are staying at home, and they're taking up their guns. So we say, we don't need no war, it's taking us back. All right, we we're having a conversation with Ms. Janelle Brown, Janelle Brown, and uh, she's an author, poet, a short story writer, a literature writer, everything in writing is Janelle. Um, Janelle, and she's here because she's also have her latest children's book, My Mommy, the Superhero. Um, Janelle, if you weren't a writer and a, an educator, what would have been your next step? What would have been your next career path? If I wasn't, I would have probably been a dancer. Anything to do with the arts, because even um, I picked up digital arts, started teaching myself that, painting, all of this. So when I was about 15, I'd been dancing for a couple of years. So I was telling my mother all about how the only way I'd go to university is if I go to study dance. And then I stopped dancing around the same time. But if I had to do anything else, I'd probably be a dancer. I'm probably not as limber now, so I can't manage that. So I better you're, stick with the right thing. You're only 25, don't worry. <laughs> Is there anything else that we didn't ask you that you would like to say or promote or, or mention about it? Well, 
I think I would just like to speak on the literary atmosphere in St. Vincent. I think we get very insular about certain things. So for example, when somebody is being lauded as an artist, then everyone focuses on this one person and then it becomes hard for upcoming artists to break into that exclusive group. I know because when it comes to writing, that was happening for a while. And now that I feel like some doors are being opened up to me, I want those same opportunities to come to other persons who are upcoming writers as well. So I think we have to be mindful in terms of how, how we maximize our platform. I believe in never just my platform is for me and me alone, and then I'm threatened when somebody else comes along. I think that we should try as far as possible to uplift one another, which is what you are doing with your platform and the way that you share your shine with others. I think that's very commendable. In terms of promotion, um, I would just like to promote maybe my Facebook page, which is under my government name, Janiel F.J. Brown. That's my Facebook page. And it's mm -hmm. also the name of my YouTube channel with brackets, The Butterfly Effect. So Janiel F.J. Brown, Facebook and YouTube. And that's about it. Yeah, you can okay. follow my writing there. Okay, just let them know what they can expect on your YouTube because you have um, your, I know you have your um, vlogging or if you want to call it vlogging, and then you have just let them know. Don't worry, see as so, much as you can, see as much as you can, because there'll be people watching this even after today. So, see as much as okay. you can to promote uh, to promote your story. No, my my YouTube channel is about as sporadic as I am, so I do my writing, I talk about my stories, I will be covering my travels, because I love traveling, but because of COVID, you know, things got shut down. So I'll be covering whenever I travel. I also will be doing videos about mental health. I'm very passionate about mental health and bringing awareness to that. So my YouTube is basically a lifestyle channel that follows things that I'm interested in, things I'm passionate about, and I hope that people will be willing to come along for the ride. One thing I tell you, Janil, um, just before Moulton wrap up there, we are looking to bring a program concerning marital health. We are looking for people to um, participate. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to put your name down. And as soon as we get enough people, we'll be having our program uh, strictly on marital health. Excellent. I think it's very necessary, especially right now. Yeah. Yep, that's the problem with our people. Sometimes we think uh, we think mental health is just being crazy. It's not, you know. So yep. that's I'm glad you're, you're doing that. You know, um, Janelle, it's, it's been uh, an absolute pleasure. Um, we want to have you back again when, um, whenever you feel, whenever you're ready, whenever you feel comfortable. Always feel free to stop by because everybody who comes on to Vinci Internet Radio, they're automatically family. So. Um, oh, thank please, you. Feel free to hit me up. I will forward you some info, and I think I might have somebody who might be able to help in the publishing uh, area. I'll I'll have a conversation with them, I'll, and we'll keep in touch with whatever you're doing. Continue to do good. Thank you so you know, much. Make good literature, good plays, good. You know, I'm also into the the arts line. I, I like anything to do with you know arts and and culture too. You know, so you're right down my alley. Um, you know, I'm proud of what you're doing, and the whole of St. Vincent should be proud also of what you're doing at 25. It's a, it's a great achievement, but like you said, you just begun. You haven't started yet. So it's been a wonderful pleasure, Moulton says, and I will catch you again. And Thank you so much for don't, having don't, me. Don't be shy. Anytime you have anything, anytime you want to do anything, just um, Moulton is a contact person. Just get on to him. Uh, if you can't find him, then you can look for CP Walk on, um, on my Facebook page and send me a message. But don't be shy, you know. Um, while we are here at BNC Internet Radio is to give people the opportunity to develop themselves. The exposure is very important, you know, and mm -hmm. anything that we can do to help, we definitely will. 
I mean, Milton already said he's going to look into some um, publishing um, rights or some publishers so that we can go. So that's that's what we are here. We are here basically to promote, as I say, Vinci to the bone, Vinci force. So anything Vinci is is my uh, is my priority. Sometimes sometimes he lick me for it, but I you can't <laughs> you can't take Saint Vincent on to me. That's that's how I that's how I am. So so John, three thousand percent. It was really a pleasure having you around and um, Vinci Internet Radio. And as I said, don't be shy. You know, treat treat us as family. And anytime you want to come back, eh, just say the word and we'll make preparation for you. But in the meantime, I, I'm going to give you the last word. You have the last word on this program. Thank you so much. This is an honor. I wish I had time to prepare. <laughs> but I'll just end off the way I end all of my YouTube videos by reminding everybody that they are special. There is something inside of you that somebody needs. And don't let nobody take it for idiot. I always say that because you are unique and the most important thing you can do for yourself other than serving God is being yourself. Sure. Thank you for having me. All right, we we're having a conversation with Ms. Janelle Brown, Janelle Brown, and uh, she's an author, poet, a short story writer, a literature writer, everything in writing is Janelle. Um, Janelle, and she's here because she's also have her latest children's book, My Mommy, the Superhero. Um, Janelle, if you weren't a writer and uh, an educator, what would have been your next step? What would have been your next career path? If I wasn't, I would have probably been a dancer. Anything to do with the arts because even um, I picked up digital art, started teaching myself that, painting, all of this. So when I was about 15, I'd been dancing for a couple of years. So I was telling my mother all about how the only way I'd go to university is if I go to study dance. And then I stopped dancing around the same time. But if I had to do anything else, I'd probably be a dancer. I'm probably not as limber now. So I can't manage that. So I better you're, stick with the right thing. You're only 25, don't worry. <laughs> Is there anything else that we didn't ask you that you would like to say or promote or, or mention about it? Well, I think I would just like to speak on the literary atmosphere in St. Vincent. I think we get very insular about certain things. So for example, when somebody is being lauded as an artist, then everyone focuses on this one person and then it becomes hard for upcoming artists to break into that exclusive group. I know because when it comes to writing, that was happening for a while. And now that I feel like some doors are being opened up to me, I want those same opportunities to come to other persons who are upcoming writers as well. So I think we have to be mindful in terms of how, how we maximize our platform. I believe in never just my platform is for me and me alone, and then I'm threatened when somebody else comes along. I think that we should try as far as possible to uplift one another, which is what you are doing with your platform and the way that you share your shine with others. I think that's very commendable. In terms of promotion, um, I would just like to promote maybe my Facebook page, which is under my government name, Janiel F.J. Brown. That's my Facebook page. And it's mm -hmm. also the name of my YouTube channel with brackets, The Butterfly Effect. So mm -hmm. Janiel F.J. Brown, Facebook and YouTube. And that's about it. Yeah, you can okay. follow my writing there. Okay, just let them know what they can expect on your YouTube because you have um, your, I know you have your um, vlogging or if you want to call it vlogging, and then you have just let them know. Don't worry, see as so, much as you can, see as much as you can, because there'll be people watching this even after today. So, see as much as okay. you can promote uh, to promote your story. 
No, my my YouTube channel is about as sporadic as I am. So I do my writing. I talk about my stories. I will be covering my travels because I love traveling, but because of COVID, you know, things got shut down. So I'll be covering whenever I travel. I also will be doing videos about mental health. I'm very passionate about mental health and bringing awareness to that. So my YouTube is basically a lifestyle channel that follows things that I'm interested in, things I'm passionate about. And I hope that people will be willing to come along for the ride. One thing I tell you, Janil, um, just before Moulton wrap up there, we are looking to bring a program concerning marital health. We are looking for people to um, participate. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to put your name down. And as soon as we get enough people, we'll be having our program uh, strictly on marital health. Excellent. I think it's very necessary, especially right now. Yeah. Yep, that's the problem with our people. Sometimes we think uh, we think mental health is just being crazy. It's not, you know. So yep. that's I'm glad you're you're doing that. You know, um, Janelle, it's, it's been uh, an absolute pleasure. Um, we want to have you back again when, um, whenever you feel, whenever you're ready, whenever you feel comfortable. Always feel free to stop by because everybody who comes on to Fancy Internet Radio, they're automatically family. So. Um, oh, thank please you. feel free to hit me up. I will forward you some info, and I think I might have somebody who might be able to help in the publishing uh, area. I'll I'll have a conversation with them, I'll, and we'll keep in touch with whatever you're doing. Continue to do good. Thank you, so you know, much. Make good literature, good plays, good. You know, I'm also into the the arts line. I, I like anything to do with you know arts and and culture too. You know, so you're right down my alley. Um, you know, I'm proud of what you're doing, and the whole of St. Vincent should be proud also of what you're doing at 25. It's a, it's a great achievement, but like you said, you just begun. You haven't started yet. So it's been a wonderful pleasure, Moulton says, and I will catch you again. And Thank you so much for don't, having don't, me. Don't be shy. Anytime you have anything, anytime you want to do anything, just um, Moulton is a contact person. Just get on to him. Uh, if you can't find him, then you can look for CP Walk on, um, on my Facebook page and send me a message. But don't be shy. You know, um, while we are here at Vinci Internet Radio is to give people the opportunity to develop themselves. The exposure is very important, you know, and mm -hmm. anything that we can do to help, we definitely will. I mean, Motor already said he's going to look into some um, publishing um, rights or some publishers so that we can go. So that's that's what we are here. We are here basically to promote, as I say, Vinci to the bone, Vinci force. So anything Vinci is is my uh, is my priority. Sometimes sometimes he lick me for it, but I you can't <laughs> you can't take St. Vince out to me. That's that's how I that's how I am. So so John, three thousand percent. It was really a pleasure having you around and um, Vinci Internet Radio and as I said, don't be shy, you know, treat treat us as family. And anytime you want to come back here, eh, just say the word and we'll make preparation for you. But in the meantime, I, I'm going to give you the last word. You have the last word on this program. Thank you so much. This is an honor. I wish I had time to prepare. <laughs> but I'll just end off the way I end all of my YouTube videos by reminding everybody that they are special. There is something inside of you that somebody needs. And don't let nobody take you for idiot. I always say that because you are unique. And the most important thing you can do for yourself, other than serving God, is being yourself. Thank you for having me.